or your friendly neighborhood colorectal surgeon. And I'm so glad you nerds tuned in. We're talking gut stuff. And this is the part of the streaming where you don't get to see my face because I'm desperately working behind the scenes <laughs> to connect my live video. And there's this delay and it always throws me off. So um, now that I'm over that, <laughs> I'm getting better. I feel like I'm getting better. Um, well, good morning. And today we're going to talk about something kind of important and very complex, actually. Um, so it'll, it'll take multiple little lectures, but this is our introduction. Um, I did import a little automated chat thing. I'm not good enough to check the chat and then have this conversation. So I've got a little chat thing. And so if you leave a comment, it's going to leave a comment to you. And if you want, it'll leave you some links on my website so you can learn more. It's just if it's obnoxious, y'all tell me, because I don't know. I don't know the system. You know what I'm saying? Um, as per usual, if you are um, listening on Spotify, or if you're just driving down the road and you're playing YouTube or something like that, and you're hearing my voice and not seeing, or as it turns out, you know, not all the formats are the same. So sometimes you can't see my little slides. And it is for this reason that I will um, upload the PDF of these slides that I'm showing to my website. That way, if you want to peruse them later, you've got access to it. So the microbiome is a particular favorite concept of mine, um, only because it is so important and no one really talks about it. Now I am a microbiologist by training before I went to medical school. That's sort of what I did. I have a master's degree in microbiology and um, I've always found it very fascinating. It's one of the reasons I've gravitated probably to intestinal surgery because I just do find it unique and interesting how your body communicates with its environment just like your eyes can see things and your ears can hear things well your skin can feel things and your intestinal tract can also communicate so every surface of your body that has exposure to the outside world communicates with the outside world and it all happens without your knowledge and i just find that amazing the way the body is created. So it's important to understand that the inside of your intestinal tract is actually in constant communication with the outside world. It's not just poop in or food in, poop out. That tube is a continuum of the outside world and your body gets to interact with it to extract from it what it needs. It's like your eyeballs can extract from the outside world what it needs to see. And your ears can do that to hear. Your skin can do that to avoid things or enjoy things. Your intestinal tract does the same thing. It is critical because the nutrients that keep your body alive come to you via this intestinal tract. So it serves a function to keep you alive and it also helps you interact with the outside world. And more importantly, and where we're learning this as time goes on, the system is so complex and these trillions of organisms become unified in their voice that it actually functions. Your poop actually functions as a separate organ. What? That seems so crazy, but that is what's happening. <laughs> Um, it's important for you to know that the majority of the genetic material that you're walking around with is not your own. Like 99% of it belongs to these organisms. And so we all need to learn how to play in the sandbox together. If you're a germaphobe, this is going to bother you. <laughs> um, but it is critical. Okay. So the microbiome and there's enteric microbiome, which is kind of what I'm going to focus on today. But everything around you is coded in microorganisms, everything. Um, your food that you consume, the water that you drink, the air that you breathe, the surfaces that you're laying down on or interacting with. I mean, they all contain their own little microbiome. And you will ingest that. It will become part of you. I know, it's freaky, right? Anyway. The organisms that make up the microbiome 
are varied and complex and may actually include more than what we include here. This is just what we know about. The first are prokaryotes, and, and that's bacteria. There's a couple different types of bacteria. You know, there's gram positive, gram negative. We're not here for that argument. That's <laughs> a lot of science. There is a classification of bacterial-like organisms that have a slightly different cell wall. They're called archaea. And so they're single cell organisms. They are not eukaryotic in their nature, which means they do have a cell wall. They can tolerate really, really harsh environments. And so uh, the intestinal tract is definitely a harsh environment. And so they're called archaea. Uh, then there are eukaryotes, and that will include um, parasites. Oh my God, and I didn't mean to unroof the parasite thing. Not everyone is riddled with parasites. Get that out of your mind. There are some people who have the occasional little parasite. It's part of the human condition. But not everyone has a parasite. Some people are convinced everything that's wrong with us is parasitic in its nature, and that's not really accurate. Um, and then there's fungi and yeast, which technically do fall into sort of a the plant kingdom, eukaryotic world. And then there are viruses, there are human viruses, and then there are bacterial viruses, and there are viruses to the yeast and the fungus, and there's probably viruses to the archaea, and there may be viruses to the viruses. I mean, it's really, you know, it's a complex system. This is all coursing around inside your intestinal tract, believe it or not, and it has been there since your birth. And so we talk about, you know, the uterus as being a sterile environment, and the baby is floating around, and they're completely sterile. However, the vagina is not sterile and the inside of the uterus may or may not be perfectly sterile. And so you're getting populated with bacteria the second you're born because you've got to pass through an unsterile environment. You're going to interact with your mom and breast milk. And all this is an unsterile environment. It is interesting that babies that are born by C-section have a completely different microbiome for the first couple of weeks of their lives than babies that were born vaginally. Um, what is the clinical significance of that? I'm not sure that we 100% know. Um, the microbiome that you're colonized with at birth is responsible for um, your immunity and protecting you against inflammation and it's providing you with micronutrients and it's helping you as a little baby, a little baby to digest milk, breast milk. And so all of this is critically important from the time of your birth. It is interesting that your microbiome is like a fingerprint. It's very unique. Um, there are certain derangements of microbiome that tend to fall in families just because you're in close proximity to the family. But yours will be very different than, let's say, your spouses or your children or your parents. Um, and it is just because you will have unique content, uh, connection with certain things. You might play with the dog more. Little kids go out in the dirt. Okay, now you're talking parasites. <laughs> go play in some dirt. Um <laughs> You know, that's what kids do. Um, and then they, they, they get it on their hands. They don't wash their hands. They stick their hands like up your nose and in your face. And, and then you get populated with the same things. Okay. And I know the germaphobes out there this morning are thinking, this is too early for me to be talking about this, but it's critically important. And we'll get to why in just a second. You just need to know how is it all these organisms get there. These organisms will line your lips all the way to the anus and then your outside skin. It's a continuum. And some people are like, so I'm a cannoli. You are a cannoli. It's a true fact. A very complex cannoli. Um, what is lining your cannoli, so to speak, right, is something called an endothelium. It is a single cell layer. And I don't know if you can see my little thingy, but this from here down to here, this is one cell, top skinny little thing. I know it looks like, well, there's multiple layers. That's one layer, and just the way you cut across it makes it look like the nuclei are at different levels. Um, they are sitting on top of a protein membrane called the basement membrane. The top of here will have some little external structures. Some of this is mucus. Some of this are little finger-like structures that help the cells interact with the outside environment and absorb nutrients. Um, the normal absorption of nutrients is supposed to go through these cells. 
Okay. And your body is supposed to have control over everything that goes from here, the harsh environment to down here, which is you, all this pink stuff is you and all the white stuff is the outside world, even though that's inside your intestinal tract. So these cells sit on a basement membrane. And then underneath that is a collagen layer that contains blood vessels and lymphatics. And under that is a little muscular layer called the muscular uh, mucosa. And that allows a folding of the lining of the intestinal tract. And then there's like another little layer of collagen. And then there's the smooth muscle layer of the intestinal tract itself. But if anything from this outside world, where it's white at the top of this um, slide, penetrates even to this little thin purple line down here, the basement membrane, without going through the cell, you cause inflammation. So if any of the intestinal contents slips between cells instead of going through the cells, now you've got toxins sitting on what is you. And this starts the beginning of every known chronic human disease, probably even cancer, certainly some cancers, maybe all of them, even remotely. This is the beginning of neurologic disease. This is the beginning of diabetes. This is the beginning of metabolic disease. If the contents of the intestinal tract slip between the intestinal cells, instead of diffusing through the intestinal cells at a controlled rate is when you get derangement of the human body. Now, when you consider this intestinal tract is 20 feet long, I mean, you know, how many trillions of intestinal cells have to be lined up perfectly without any gaps to make sure this system occurs without injury to you? Rather miraculous, to be honest with you. This system is innervated from your brain all the way to the anal canal, believe it or not, and beyond, your brain is in charge of everything. We call the intestinal tract your second brain because uniquely it has its own nervous system and uniquely that nervous system is collecting neurotransmitters from your intestinal tract to get into your brain. So um, the way the intestinal tract communicates with your brain is a little bit unique. Um, and, and thus quite fascinating because as it turns out, you do have shit for brains. <laughs> so just so you know, um, so the GI innervation is interesting. There's the autonomic nervous system, and this begins with the vagus nerve. This is the 10th cranial nerve, not to get too anatomic this early in the morning, but that a cranial nerve is a nerve that starts actually in the brain. It doesn't start in the spinal cord like a lot of your peripheral nerves will. Um, starts actually in your brain. This is how important this nerve is. And it connects your head, more specifically the mouth, the pharynx, your throat, some of your ability to speak, the esophagus, the stomach, the entirety of the small intestine and half of the colon are all connected with the vagus nerve. Direct connection to the brain. There's an overlapping system that connects the hind gut, so the distal transverse colon, rectum, anus, to the upper intestinal tract and therefore the brain in what's called the enteric nervous system. What's unique about this is that those nerves are not connected to your spinal cord at all. They are a series of ganglia and ganglia like little mini brains little mini brains live along the length right underneath the lining of the intestinal tract and then also within the wall of the intestinal tract. So you've got a submucosal ganglion and you've got myenteric in the muscle ganglion and that occurs from the esophagus to the anus and these two systems overlap and so they communicate. So your brain basically has control of the entirety of the intestinal tract. There are some congenital derangements of this innervation, which we will not cover today. Just rest assured, unless you have that, and very few people have that, the whole system is connected to your brain. Okay. Um, your brain is responsible for balance. This is why you can stand upright. This is why you can walk. It's why you can coordinate words. 
Um, it's why you don't have double vision and it's why you don't have double hearing. It's because your brain is able to take all these signals and coordinate them. And then your response to these signals becomes corrective and coordinating. Okay, so if I feel like I'm about to fall this way, my brain corrects to keep me upright. Okay, so that's considered homeostasis. Just think of a hula hoop. Your brain is doing the hula hoop action with every aspect of your world. And it's, and it's a lot. It's like the world's greatest supercomputer is your brain. Tell me you're not created in a wonderful way. It's just, it'll blow your mind, which then has to you know correct for that blowed mind. <laughs> anyway, so your brain is responsible for homeostasis. The GI tract helps your brain with this homeostasis. But the GI tract then also has its own endocrine function. So if you were to, for example, have a severing of the vagus nerve, we will do this uh, surgically, believe it or not. We'll break the vagus nerve. Now what? The intestinal tract can still coordinate. Why would we ever do such a thing? That was a very old-fashioned surgery we used to do for ulcer disease. Um, and it's seldom done now. Now we do these highly selective vagotomies and I don't even know if they do that anymore with the advent of these H2 blockers. But, um, you know, when I was in my surgery residency, we were just moving from truncal vagotomies to selective vagotomies, not to age myself, but your intestinal tract can still coordinate without this nervous interaction. The, the problem is you're cutting off some important connect communication from your intestinal tract to your brain when you do that. But the GI endocrine function will coordinate your digestion. It will coordinate your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your response to stress hormones. Yes, stress in your intestinal tract are, are connected. We've talked about that in another lecture. The intestinal tract is also the largest immune system organ in your body. It is aligned, as you can imagine, with lymphatics. And your body's constantly actually letting in little bits of stuff into the lymphatic areas to constantly test it. People who do not have intestinal uh, integrity get very rapid infections and people who have poor immune systems. And you can be born with an, an immune derangement where you don't have this mucosal immunity, these people can get sick very easily. So this is a critical part of your function of wellness is to have an intact intestinal system and intact lymphatic system and immunity, what we call IgA immunity. So the endocrine function of your intestinal tract is incredibly important. So now where does the poo come in? Like what's with these bacteria? Well, there are some good guys, some critical to health bacteria. You have to have them because these bacteria help promote the neuroendocrine function of your intestinal tract by making short chain fatty acids. When you consume certain foods, these bacteria turn that into butyrate, which is an anti-inflammatory for the lining, propionate, which gets absorbed into the bloodstream and goes to your liver and helps support liver health. These bacteria make good vitamins. In particular, the B vitamins are really critical. And these bacteria make neurotransmitters. So many neurologic derangements are actually derangements of the microbiome in your intestinal tract. If you have anxiety, depression, autism, ADD, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, a lot of these disorders have disordered microbiomes. And there's a lot of research going into doing fecal transplants, actually, what they call crapsules. There's literally a company making enteric coated poop pills. Yum. But they're having enormous success. And, and the studies I've seen are on schizophrenia. Uh, but they're having, and, and autism, I believe, and they're having enormous success. How, how amazing is that? You have to be really critical with, and one day we'll talk about um, the fecal transplant thing, because that's a fascinating science in and of itself. There are bad guys. So just like you can transfer good guys in a fecal transplant, you can transfer bad guys in a fecal transplant. There was a famous study where they took sterile rats, 
sterile mice. They're born in a sterile environment. They really don't have these bacteria. And they fed them the poop of mice that were genetically just like ADD, ADD mice. I thought all mice were ADD to be frank, but anyway, so, so, and you could see an anxiety riddled personality change in these sterile mice after giving them essentially a fecal transplant from anxiety riddled mice, which is fascinating to me because when you look at the world around you, how anxiety seems to be ramped up. And yes, I think external environments of social media and stuff probably feed into that, but, but our microbiomes must be deranged. And I suspect that is related to toxins in our environment that we consume, which is kind of how I started talking about nutrition 15 years ago. I'm 100% convinced that, you know, it's in the water or the food or the air. I, you know, it's something in our environment. <laughs> it's making us all crazy. Um, what do the bad guys do? They can lead to chronic disease. Yes, there are pathogens, right? So a parasite is a pathogen you don't all have pathogenic disease from a parasite. I'll do a lecture on that. I think the world needs to be educated. I don't know who the audience is who thinks everyone's got a damn parasite. We'll do a conversation on that. There are some parasitic infections. That's not what I'm talking about today. Um, there are um, pathogenic bacteria, Salmonella, Shigella, certain strains of E. coli, Yersinia, et cetera. And I'm not talking about those either. I'm simply talking about what you would think would be, yeah, they're in their bacteria, but eh, they don't really serve your best purpose. Um, these, they make their own little toxins. They live in their little world. They're just doing their thing. They're not invading into your body like some of these other pathogens, but they make their toxins and your body doesn't respond well to those toxins, especially in the presence of inflammation. Um, there are certain of these toxins in the presence of inflammation that inadvertently get into your body and they can cause fatty liver and metabolic disease and um, autoimmune diseases and alterations of your neurotransmitters. All of these derangements come with a faulty microbiome in combination with inflammation and a breaking of the endothelial lining, what we call leaky gut. And leaky gut is a layman's term. A lot of doctors don't use that, but, um, but it's a true phenomenon. <laughs> so um, how about some of the neurotransmitters that are made by the bacteria in your intestinal tract? So dopamine, a lot of people think, okay, yeah, when you go on social media and you get that dopamine hit, you do. But, you know, 70% of the dopamine in your body is coming from the food that you're eating. Your body can make its own dopamine. This is a true fact. Um, a lot of neurologic diseases are a deficiency of dopamine. So if you could make more dopamine or keep it in your system longer, you can offset some diseases. So a normal microbiome on full function making dopamine truly can help with dopamine deficiency diseases. So, and then you have norepinephrine, serotonin is a big one because anxiety, depression comes from these serotonin um, problems, uh, GABA, which is a, um, a neurotransmitter that we see a lot deficiencies in sleep disorders, obesity, and so forth and so on. So these things are incredible, incredibly important. Your brain requires them. A lot of these substances can be made by the foods that you consume in your own body, but a lot of them are made by the bacteria themselves and your body just absorbs them. Okay. So this gets us to the concept of the gut brain axis, um, or the microbiome brain axis, to be honest with you. Um, the microbiome is constantly sending signals to your brain, whether you like it or not. Um, and it is because they're making serotonin. They're making dopamine. These things are positive feedback neurotransmitters. So if you engage into a behavior like eating something that causes your microbiome to make a lot of serotonin or dopamine or whatever, you now have a positive feedback mechanism. This becomes a very powerful driving force to behavior. It's one of the reasons why sugar is so addicting. 
when you eat sugar, you get an explosion of serotonin in particular. It's carbohydrates lead to serotonin. And your brain likey, your brain likey when you're depressed, you broke up with your boyfriend or you failed the test. Your boss is an asshole. Um, you go home and you eat something carbolicious because that gives you a serotonin rush. And then the stress response of that negative event causes increased levels of cortisol in your body. And then that further selects for bacteria that will happily give you that serotonin rush. So you're feeding a population of bacteria so they grow faster than everybody else. And then your body is making a hormone that suppresses everybody else, thus making that population even bigger. You can see how you could get into an overeating cycle very easily, um, especially when first world problems, we have access to food like nobody's business. It's everywhere. Highly processed, high carbohydrate foods are very inexpensive. And so that seems to be the first go-to thing that we get to. So now you can see how we're all diseased. Um, Certain foods are awesome because they will cause you to secrete short chain fatty acids, the butyrate, the propionate. These offset inflammation and help your liver process carbohydrates so you don't get the sugar spikes and all that kind of stuff. The issue is those important items are created by, by bacteria after you've consumed fiber, right? So when you're depressed, you don't reach for an apple typically or a kiwi fruit. Typically, you reach for haagen or some other sort of junk food snack. So um, it's learned behavior by feedback. And this is how your microbiome has trained you and why I am big on the concept that we need to train our own microbiomes. Okay. So biochemical signals are sent from your microbiome are talking to your brain and changing your behavior. You are making decisions that are really being driven by this population of bacteria. So it's one of the reasons I don't like the, I don't have willpower. I had someone, we'll talk about that in a minute, but I had someone who I was saying, okay, you need to go gluten-free. We're going to do a deep dive on gluten-free, but not today. You need to go gluten-free and stay away from sugar and all that kind of stuff and all these addicting things, bread and sugar. And someone says, I'd love to, but after two weeks, she's like, I can't do it. I just don't have the willpower. And as it turns out, this is not a willpower issue. Um, this is a training of the microbiome issue. Okay. You're getting signals that are so powerful, created by hormones um, that are very hard to override. So it's not really a willpower issue. It's more of a, what's in your microbiome? What is the signal it's sending to your brain? What are you feeding that microbiome to make that signal stronger? And can we feed ourselves different to make that signal suppress? So that way we can train the microbiome instead of it training us. Okay. Um, and we've already kind of talked about that. You know, you eat something, it selects for a bacterial population that may be making you engage in this eating habit of eating processed food and you can't break it repeated diet choices. And it is shy. I mean, I have patients They come in, they have all kinds of gut upset and we go over their diet. They're like, my diet hasn't changed. My diet hasn't changed in 50 years. I've eaten the same breakfast, the same lunch, the same snacks and the same dinner every single day of my life for 50 years. And I'm just now having this problem. And so a lot of people cannot understand why they're suddenly not capable of tolerating their diet. Um, and it is because the food has changed. And when the food changes, you're now selecting for a different set of organisms. And the second that imbalance occurs, you've got symptoms. If that makes sense, it's like being in your garden and putting all the plants out there at the same exact light level, pH, water level, you know, um, you can't do that. Some plants like to be in the dry. Some plants like to be in the shade. Um, and so it's 
you can't treat all these bacteria the same. They all eat different things based on what you eat. A varied diet is critically important, especially if you're experiencing problems. Okay. And now some, a lot of times when you get into this dysbiosis, what dysbiosis means there's a lack of balance. You'll have bowel issues, but not always. Usually exhaustion. That seems to be one of the most common cloudy thoughts. Can't focus at 3 PM doldrums. Can't focus. I'm exhausted. Um, anxiety, depression, inflammation, obesity, metabolic disease, chronic illness, autoimmune disease, cancers. Start with this dysbiosis. Now make sure you're hearing what I'm saying right now. Fixing this dysbiosis is not going to reverse your cancer. That's not what I'm saying, right? So I don't need people saying, oh, Dr. Toker said I don't need my chemotherapy. That is not what I'm saying. I think we covered that on a different lecture also. What I'm saying is fix a dysbiosis early. If you fix it early, you can prevent chronic illness. Our population is aging. We're seeing lots and lots of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. We're considering these diseases type three diabetes because they are associated with metabolic disease, which by the way, starts with this dysbiosis. Okay. So start now. If you're young, healthy with no issues, start now. So you never get them. The whole point is, and I think everyone can sense it. And some people are watching from Europe and other parts of the world, but um, the healthcare sit doctors have experienced a very odd training change where it's become very formulaic. We're being replaced with non-doctor extenders. People aren't using their brains anymore to diagnose anything. It's just like, here's the pill, here's the pill, here's the pill, here's the pill. There's a lot of different reasons for that. I don't want to get political. Um, but we're all recognizing the quality of healthcare is, is going down. Okay. It's very disappointing, but it is going down. And as I get older, I think to myself, holy cow, who's going to take care of me when I'm older? The answer is I don't know, which means start now, start now because the quality of healthcare is going down. Um, and this is true in all parts of the world. Um, so I, when it comes down to, holy cow, Toger, you're telling me that something's gone nuts in my GI tract. Why am I going to fix it? I didn't mean to riddle you into anxiety. Anxiety will make it worse. So what I like to do is have kind of a scientific approach. I am a person of science. Um, know your enemy. You have to be able to name the enemy in order to defeat it. And in the world of nutrition, uh, you got to be able to name its processed food non-nutritive additives, artificial sweeteners. And as it turns out, it's going to be wheat and sugar and probably a lot of the grains that we consume that are causing some of this dysbiosis. You have to be able to say that out loud without being persecuted. Otherwise, we'll never be able to fix the problem. Now, <clears throat> Your regular doctor does not have time for this conversation. And fortunately, there are a series of companies who try to make this easy for you. This is not the only one. The one that I use is at Viome. And I don't know that that website, Viome.com is the main website. I don't think you can type in slash Dr. Anna and actually get anything different. Um, because there's a long chain of events. Just go to Viome.com and look at their process. I like them because it's directed to the patient, not the doctor. They use common language. I've seen my own patients and my own family benefit greatly from services like this. You don't need to use their service in particular. If you use the word Dr. Toker when you check out, so if you go to Viome.com, and you check out, if you pop in the word Dr. Toker as a code, D-R-T-O-K-E-R, they'll give you $100 off of the kit that you buy. I don't have that deal with all the other places. So, so if you want to save a little money, most of these companies charge about the same thing, probably around $250. Um, it's genetic testing for your poop. 
And what it does, and I say it results in six weeks, they've just updated to results are probably in two to three weeks. They will do an in-depth questionnaire of all your symptoms. You send off the specimen to them. They do genetic testing on that, looking at all the different organisms, looking for dysbiosis. Then they will send you a list of foods to avoid, and they'll send you a list of foods to eat a lot of, and a list of foods that, eh, eat some, you're fine. This is six months worth of advice. The list of foods on your don't consume for six months is very likely going to be food that you love, that you eat every single day. And why is that? Because you're eating it every single day and you have trained your microbiome to be dysfunctional. And this company wants to undo that, which means you're going to have to starve out those bacteria for some time. If you eat a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, and if you happen to love tomatoes and bell peppers, many of you may have a particular virus that attacks tomatoes and bell peppers. And it stays alive in your intestinal tract, but it causes inflammation as a result. And so if bell peppers and tomatoes shows up on your don't eat, it's usually a 30 day period of time, which is hard for me. Those are my two favorite veggies. <laughs> oh my, that was a bad month. It was a bad month to do without tomatoes and, and bell peppers. It was only a month though. Um, so follow the advice, follow the recommendations. That is a snapshot in time. This is genetic testing of your poop and not genetic testing of you. It's not an allergy test. They're not saying if you're allergic or not. They're saying these are the foods to avoid and these are the things to do. And if you do that, you'll readjust your microbiome into balance and it can take up to six months. The second you engage in antibiotics, that's, that whole snapshot changes. And if you experience a sudden stressful event that you didn't have to begin with, that's not snapshot will change. It's a snapshot and it changes in time, no different than an x-ray or blood test. Okay. Now there is DNA testing. And again, there are a lot of companies that do this DNA testing. There's a second testing company called stride DNA, um, that are, yeah, it's called stride DNA and they're in Europe. So if any of you guys, and I do have some people watching in the UK and Ireland um, and Europe, it's called Stride, S-T-R-I-D-E. And um, they do the same testing in Europe. And so I am interacting with these people. They're launching their new company. They are doing the DNA testing right now, and they will be launching their microbiome testing in a month. So if you're in another country and you're thinking, oh, I can't use those companies because they're American and I don't think they'll ship to America to, to Europe. Stride DNA is the answer to that. And there may be other European companies. I just don't know who they are. Um, and again, Stride DNA testing at Viome, they will bundle. You can do the DNA and the stool test as a bundle and you can still use that Dr. Toker code. DNA testing is yours for life. It never changes. So if it says you're not genetically capable of tolerating wheat, for example, that means you're a celiac person. You'll never be able to tolerate wheat. In the microbiome testing, they'll tell you to go gluten-free. That doesn't mean you should never eat wheat again for the rest of your life. I'll teach you why you should never do that. But anyway, it's just saying for right now, stay away from it. Wheat is inflammatory and 100% of the people that consume it. Um, so, so when you're trying to reset things, you need to avoid um, wheat. And, and we're going to talk about that. There's something called GI mapping um, and inflammatory markers. And I'm in the process of learning about that. This is doctor directed information. I think it's too confusing for the average person to pay attention to. So you should only be doing this type of testing through one-on-one -on -one counseling with either a nutritionist a physician. There's a lot of chiropractors who do this kind of work. There's a lot of functional medicine doctors that do this kind of work. You shouldn't try to interpret these tests on your own because the data, and I've reviewed this test with a patient um, in the past, and she's looking at me like, I was given this, I got no clue. Yeah, I know you have no clue because I almost have no clue and I'm a microbiologist. <laughs> it's very complex data that they give you as a result of this testing. 
So if you want to engage in this type of testing, you can. There is a blood test you can also do through your doctor looking for leaky gut inflammatory markers. It's less confusing because it's a yes or no answer. Whereas this can be a little bit more confusing. Okay, so those are testing options. Here's the situation, the last few minutes, so we're gonna wrap this up, is, okay, I ain't got the time for a doctor. I can't find a doctor. I don't have the money for a doctor. Um, cobble together the money on the testing from Viome or something similar. That's patient-directed. And, and this is the reason I put in the code um, for discount. Basically, any kind of referral code that I would normally get a referral fee for sending patients, I'm giving back to the patient through that code. Okay, so you're getting the referral fee as a result of using Dr. Toker. So use Viome. Save yourself money, okay? The, the information is invaluable. It's invaluable. Um, follow their advice understand the following by denying certain foods in your diet and promoting other foods that you probably are not eating right now that are going to be unique for you. They may be outside of your taste structure. I get it. But if you do that, you can correct the diversity in your microbiome. And here's fascinating. Once you get rid of the old stuff that you used to do all the time, and you start engaging in the foods that you are being told to eat, your taste buds completely change. It's shocking how sweet a salad tastes. Like I would have never, I'm a sugarholic. It's shocking how good your food tastes when you remove all the chemicals and the processing. It takes a couple of weeks to get there. So I'm begging you to muscle through it. When you do that, it allows for normal neurotransmitters. Now, all of a sudden, you're sleeping better at night. Now, all of a sudden, you're focusing a little bit better. If you're kind of scatterbrained with the ADD, if you haven't noticed, um, it helps. Okay. I, I had a patient who came to me the other day who, whose children are autistic. I told her to do it because she had IBS stuff. She decided to put the whole family on this regimen. She tested her children. She did the whole family. And everyone's, she goes, my children who had barely controllable autism now with the medicines that they're on and this diet, totally controllable. They're, 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 they are enjoying life again. And so it is very helpful. I'm not saying you're going to get rid of your medicines, but I'm saying you can have a normal life if you know this information. It's critical. The long-term implications of straightening out the intestinal tract inflammation are huge. And we'll do a series. It's going to take a series of lectures to get through all that information. No granulated sugar. Oh, that's so depressing. Especially around Easter. And, and I love a jelly bean. I'm off. I could do the jelly beans and you can give me all your black jelly beans. We've talked about that. I love liquors. <laughs> so I'm a snacky kind of a person. My mother's a dentist. It would just kill her if she knew she knows. Um, but my brother and I both, that's the side effect. If your mom or dad is a dentist, I right? The struggle is real. You're a sugar holic and you've had to hide it from your parents for a long time. Anyway, bacteria consume sugar and this acidic environment in the wrong parts of the intestinal tract. So the upper intestinal tract has to be acidic. Further down the intestinal tract should not be acidic. And as the bacteria are growing and they're booming, they're loving all this sugar, they're breaking down the mucus protective layer. And when you have no mucus, you get inflammation. And inflammation will set you up for autoimmune disease, obesity, metabolic disease, um, anxiety, et cetera. So no granulated sugar, no artificial sweeteners either. We'll talk about that in some other way. Gluten-free. I'm going to go on a gluten-free lecture series. I'm not, I'm not hating on big wheat. It's not their fault. Um, but I'll explain what the problem with gluten is when you take the inflammation related to gluten in combination with all these other chemicals, it's a disaster. Look around you. 
The disaster you see around you in society is coming just directly from the amount of sugar, wheat, artificial sweeteners, artificial flavors that are in our foods. Gluten will always be inflammatory, not just if you're celiac. Even if you don't have any intestinal complaints, it can be measured. There is a protein called zonulin. We'll talk a lot about that. That is a marker that can be measured in almost every disease starts with inflammation in the intestinal tract that can be measured, traced back to zonulin. There's a 10,000 papers in the scientific literature based on this phenomenon. This was discovered about 20 years ago. Um, the information is critical. There are drug companies that are looking at trying to block the zonulin effect. Um, why spend money on drugs? I'm telling you, go gluten-free. That's how you fix that problem. Seed oils, vegetable and canola oils. I know they tell you they're good for your heart. They're absolutely not good for your heart because of the way they are made. And because when you heat them up, they oxidize and then you consume free radicals and that sets you up for inflammation. It just is what it is. They did an interview with the guy who touted canola oil as being good for your cholesterol and the guy has recanted and said it was the saddest thing he ever did. He wished he had never published that information um, because it, look around you, a lot of that seed oil stuff. Okay. You can train your microbiome instead of your microbiome training you. Eat as many raw fruits and veggies as you can. Eat your protein, hydrate, stay active. Now, as you know, these lectures on Thursday mornings are paid for content. I highly believe in this technology. There's no medicine on it. It's a little square patch. I'm wearing one on my arm right now and one on my right hip. It's called super patch and it is a tactile sensation. Your skin is talking to your brain in the same way that your intestinal tract is. It gets a sensation. It talks to your brain. Your brain talks back. It allows homeostasis of your body. The, their patch called the Liberty Patch sets your vagal nerve into homeostasis. Okay. And one of the derangements going on in your GI tract is vagal. Liberty Patch helps that. It also helps your balance. So if you're older and you've got balance issues, that's great. It helps your GI tract. It's going to help your balance. The Peace Patch is the one I use on a daily basis. And it helps blunt this cortisol effect on your intestinal tract how your GI tract is directly attached to your stress levels. You know this intuitively, and I'm telling you the Peace Patch helps that. The GI tract is the largest immune system in your body, and their patch, the Defend Patch, helps coordinate your immune system neurologically by using ion channels that begin in your skin. This is a coordinated effort. The skin talks to your brain. Your brain sends signals to the rest of your body to put everything back into a green zone homeostasis. Now, for people who are like, I am addicted to sugar. In fact, that's what's on my patch right here. <laughs> Once I fall off, when the Easter bunny comes and brings chocolate and jelly beans to the children, you know, I have to take my mom tax. You know that I do. I, so, and then I get addicted to sugar. <sighs> And now I'm going to spend the next three or four weeks trying to kick that addiction. I, I'm not afraid to tell you. Okay. So I wear this little kick it patch. If your brain knows it's a bad habit, then it'll gives you just a split second enough time to repress the bad habit and not engage. And you really only need one or two when it comes to sugar or food, bad habits, you just need a couple of weeks to kill off that microbiome that's craving it. That sugar craving is such an addictive thing because the microbiome sent good neurotransmitters to your brain. This tells your brain, don't do it. Long enough for you to say, don't do it. I would say wear it for anywhere between 30 and 90 days to be sure that you've kicked that habit. But if you know it's a bad habit, it can help. If you don't know it's a bad habit, it will not help you. You have to know it's a bad habit for it to work. Okay. These things will set the autonomic nervous system and therefore the enteric nervous system back to homeostasis. They do not replace your doctor. They do not replace your surgery. They do not replace your medications, but they most certainly can help things get better.
You're going to use these patches in combination with your dietary changes, your stress mitigation, all to have an enormous impact in your health. And this is going to stabilize your health back to a baseline. Yes, you may still need your medications for whatever disease it may be, but I have found that if you can use these patches in condition in, in along with a clean diet, gluten-free, resetting your microbiome, the amount of prescription medical intervention decreases vastly and sometimes even goes away. So that's kind of my goal as a doctor, just get you off of all those things, live the way God wants you to live, unchained from the medical world if you can. Okay. So once again, I've talked, this time I've talked for 50 minutes. I am so sad. My podcast people who listen on Spotify are probably happy, <laughs> but uh, people who are driving to work are like, okay, Toker, I've had enough. I will post videos to podcast and the audio to Spotify. You can always go to my website, drannatoker.com, look under the services tab to get the PDF slide. So you can review those later. If you want to, that's totally free. Please do visit the products we love, things I love, because these are sponsors of this content. If, 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 if it weren't for them, I would not have spent hours putting together this conversation. I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I'd be in the operating room earning a living um, to pay for the college tuitions that I pay for instead of having companies who want me to spread their good word, like Superpatch, um, support my practice so I don't have to see as many patients. And it allows me to spread this word of good health to everybody. So please do sponsor them. Uh, and they are just superpatch.com. Okay. Um, this is a, people do sell these. Uh, it's only available online. They are online distributors. If you are an online distributor for Superpatch, please feel free to share this content with your clients. Um, if you want more information on how to become an online distributor, you can always direct message me or the company itself. They have a customer service line that you can contact. Um, or I bet you, you could Instagram or Facebook, these, you know, groups of people who are selling it, they usually will use that moniker and then hook yourself up with someone local, um, that you can talk to who can help you. Okay. Um, all right good seeing you guys again. Next week is going to be kind of an interesting topic. It's going to be how gut health positively affects your aesthetic beauty. We're getting into the springtime. It's time to get your hotness back. Um, you know, over the summer, you lose the hotness. I mean, over the, the winter, you lose your hotness. In the summertime, it's time to get that back. So it all starts with your diet. And we'll talk about that next week. Mm-mm-mm.